All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the Great American Farm Tour number one. I am so excited today. I just can't tell you. You're gonna hear it in my voice and see it on my face because today we are at Joe's Farm in Three Rivers, Michigan. I'm here with Joe Coopson. How's it going everybody? And we are super excited to take you on a live tour of Joe's Farm if you're watching the live broadcast. Um, if you have any questions, just type them in the live chat. We'll answer as many of those as we can. If you're watching the pre-recorded version of this video, just type them down in the comments below and we'll get back to you as well. But we have so much to see today. We have so much to show you. Joe has been farming for 11 years now and he's only 26, so you do the math. <laughs> he's got a lot of experience under his belt, has an amazing farm here with pastured poultry, turkeys and chickens, um, a few laying hens. He's got grass-fed cattle. Um, so so much to show you brooder operations schooners out on pasture cattle out on pasture if things go well we may even show you uh, his farm store talk about his sales a little bit uh, go to his other parcel of land where he's got even more schooners on the pasture this year alone you're raising how many broilers 30,000 30,000 broilers that is massive and he's scaled quickly um, and so I have so many questions for him I hope you do too and we're just gonna get started. I mean, as you can see here, it is just drop dead gorgeous. And we're just gonna talk all about it. So let me get this backpack on so I don't have to hold the camera the whole time. And we're just gonna get started. So Joe, what a great farm you've got. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Um, this, this farm, tell me a little bit about the farmland itself. Yep and how you came to be a steward of it. Yeah, so when we started farming, we started it in a different town about five, 10 minutes up the road. Um, but we bought this farm in 2000, uh, spring of 2015. Mm -hmm. And um, it was pretty much, it was, this barn wasn't even here. It was just this old barn, a smaller barn here in the house. And that was it. Um, we, uh, we started by putting a brooder barn up over back there, mm -hmm. and then um, and then we got you know our perimeter fence, and we've got our operation going on back there. And so when you when you started farming, uh, what was what was your first life animal that you raised? Chickens. Chickens. Yep. So I got my first chicken. I don't know, I was eight or nine, something like that. And we were actually in town, like in a town, like where we had had them for a few years, and then there was talks of like. Are chickens legal in this town? Are they not? Are they pets? Are they livestock? So then my dad was like, we better find something outside of town. And, and then that's when we started in Schoolcraft right up the road uh, with just two and a half acres. Yeah, tell me a little bit about where we're at, yep. just ge geographically speaking. So Michigan's pretty cool because I can show you on my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in Three Rivers, which is southwest Michigan, uh, St. Joe County. We're only 20 minutes from the Indiana line. Mm -hmm. So very close. Uh, Grand Rapids is a pretty big city. A lot of people know we're about an hour south of there. Nice. And cli climate wise, I mean, uh, right now, uh, all my friends and family in Arkansas would be really jealous. It was 70 degrees when I got here this yeah, morning. Yeah, it's beautiful today. Overcast. Yeah. I mean, just amazing. Uh, is this is this typical weather for summers for you guys? What's uh, the climate like for growing? Typically right now, we'd be a little more humid. Uh, we've had a nice past week or so, mm -hmm. and the rest of this week is going to be nice. Um, like we were discussing earlier in June, we got we got some hundred degree days, um, but we are definitely on the milder side, especially with Lake Michigan. We get some cooled fronts coming over the water, which is nice. Cool. So, so let, let's just see what you got right around here. So, yep. um, this right here, that's our house. This is your house. Yep. And this was on the property. The structure was on the property yes. when you guys came here. Yep. Nice. And. Your fam what what what's your family situation like? Yep. So me and my wife and one son. Awesome. Rowan, cool. My wife Adele. How, yeah. how old is your son? Four years old. Nice. Yep. And then this structure right here. Yep. That's our shop barn. So I've got my office in there, all the tools and stuff like that. And then um, this old barn. Mm -hmm. This is from like, we think it's late 1800s. Which is beautiful. I'm gonna Early get a little. Yep. And it was starting to lean pretty bad when we bought the place. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the first thing we did. We came in here and we had a guy come out and uh, there's some cables in there and we got it, poured some footings and got it all put back together. So these old barns, they're becoming more and more far and few between. 
Yeah, yeah. People are really... knocking them down, and I, I love them. So. Oh, it's so it's so classic. Absolutely. And you got your farm store in there, yep. and toward the end of the, the broadcast, we'll go inside the farm store, and you can Sounds see good. the products, the finished products. Yep. Uh, how he's selling some of those. So why don't we walk? You want to go check out yep. this area over here first, For sure. where we got uh, some fluffy creatures. So this is kind of our, we just call it our backyard flock. So they're not really <clears throat> too much for production, more family use. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually not even laying yet, but mm -hmm. they're about three, two and a half months old. So this this is just for, for the kiddos to chase. And... Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like my son's chickens. So nice. we wanted him to kind of get, start seeing if he's into the entrepreneurial things. Uh huh. Um, these goats are escape artists, so we've got this built up until we get a door put in. Might be a little dark in here. Yeah, I'll probably stay right here just so okay. folks can see. So we got a few goats. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Hi. <laughs> nice. And then, and then the back here is... Right back in there, yep. For the hens. Exactly. Cool. Awesome. Step back out here, and so tell me about uh, these hens you've got here. I like these uh, fluffy pillow yeah. ones. Yep. So those are um, silkies, and they uh, they have different feathers than most chickens. They're very uh, they're fluffy, and they've got black skin, black feet, black eyes. Awesome. Hey, uh, real quick, I want to say thanks to Sun Kim for subscribing to the channel. Thanks for the new subscriber. Um, so they have black skin. Yep. And uh, but the the meat itself is still, it probably has a tint I to believe it, right? it's black, yeah. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I have not, we haven't raised them before, mm -hmm. but we're gonna raise a few of them and process them and see how it looks. Mm -hmm. But um, nice. after nice. years and years and years of eyes of brown chickens, just all the same, mm -hmm. it's really fun to have a lot of different kinds of chickens running around. Yeah, and um, so this is a much smaller uh, laying hen size than what you're typically used to, right? Yeah, so just last fall we, really pretty almost completely got out of uh our own laying hens mm -hmm. um we work with seven sons down in fort wayne area to uh produce our eggs for us um but we were in summer 2020 we got up to six thousand hens six thousand yeah nice so that's really where i started i started in laying hens mostly that's how i started the farm that's how you got into it yep okay and didn't really start doing a lot of meat birds <clears throat> until 2016 i believe and uh, when you were first starting out, where, where were you selling your, your eggs? Uh, when we first started, farmer's markets. Uh, when we really first started, farmer's markets, and we would meet people in parking lots, and we would, I'd put a Facebook or a Craigslist ad on. And oh, you were like 15 years yeah. old out there. I, like, I wasn't driving. My mom was driving me Some around, kids had so. lemonade stands. You had egg stands, Yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. <laughs> exactly. So that's how it started. And then from, from there, we, uh, we got connected. We were actually at a... Um, farmer's market inside a local hospital, Bronson Hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, they approached us with saying, will you produce eggs for the hospital? Which, again, I was 15 years old, that was like That's awesome. the coolest thing in the world. Right, right. So, so then we, we had to, it took a few years to scale up to wh what they needed, plus we had to get a legal washing facility mm -hmm. for the eggs to do that. And um, I think over here you have some of your mobile coops, right? Yep. That, that you used to, uh, we used when, to use for hens. When you were scaling up. Exactly. Um, so maybe we can go check those out and just kind of sure. check the design of those out. Anybody in the audience uh, doing laying hens? While we're walking, we got a couple questions I yep. will get to. Um, let's see. Do you think it's better to buy a prairie schooner for layers? Or could you use an old school bus? That's from Adam Sterowitz. Uh, school bus would be pretty sweet. That would be, for sure, it would make good uh, picture content and video content. I Is, think the- Would it have to be mobile? Um, my guess is you could probably pull it somehow. I would, I would want it to be mobile personally, mm -hmm. if you were gonna do it enough of them. Um, I mean, something like that with just like 20 or 30 chickens works all right to just kind of that part. Yeah, yeah it right. just stays there. Yeah. Uh, but if you're talking, you're going to get into like a couple hundreds, mm -hmm. then I think moving them is really important. Right. Um, but the prairie schooners, um, that's what we used for hens after we used these, uh -huh. and those work really well. Oh, so the same schooners that we'll see later on we also for your for broilers, hens. you also use for laying hens. Yep. Okay, nice. 
But uh, so you got to a certain point and then you were like, I need something bigger and you came up yes. on this design. Right? So in 2017, I believe, mm -hmm. or 16, um, I went and saw Polyface Farms, got mm -hmm. a tour with Joel Salatin and they have their big um, A-frame, I can't remember what they call it. It's on skids though. Mm -hmm. And I came back uh, and a week later we had this built and I thought it was the coolest thing, you know. So that's where I got the design and idea from. Mm -hmm. And then we built, uh, we actually have two more in the field and I sold one. So we had five of these at one time. And now you've, you've repurposed them for other uses, which we'll talk about later too, exactly. right? Yep. And so you said the, the polyface designs are on skids, but yep. you have yours on wheels. Yep. How did that work out for you? Um, the wheels, they move easier, but they don't stop as easy either. Mm -hmm. So I, we prefer things on skids personally, if you've got a tractor or something to pull stuff around with, I think it's a lot safer. Mm -hmm. um, but the wheels do move. They, I mean, I could, I could pretty much push and pull this by hand if Got, I needed to. It's, gotcha. That's how how easy it moves. So what are what are these right here? These boxes. Those are our nesting boxes from when we had hens. So these are rollout nesting boxes. Mm -hmm. um, chickens would. These would be mounted on the wall. Mm -hmm. They would jump up in here, lay their eggs. And then it rolls down into that tray right there. They'd be mounted on the wall of what? Um, either the hoop house, the prairie schooners, mm -hmm. or uh, even on these, we'd put them right on that wood right there. And okay, on that lateral piece yep. right there. So that could get mounted right here. And then they just hop on and we go through and collect the eggs. Super cool. You're obviously not using these anymore. Yep. You don't have a ton of laying hens out on pasture. Yep. What happened? So our eggs, we decided to get our really scaled down eggs at least, because um, we kind of had a turning point. It's either grow the meat side or grow the egg side. And for us, financially and labor-wise, the meat side made a lot more sense. Gotcha. Okay. So just to pivot because the business yep. sense, it made sense to do that. Yeah, exactly. So cool. So I mean, um, COVID really, really made you think about a lot of things and change a lot of things. And it was kind of like, you got to grow. You don't have to grow, but if you want to grow, you kind of got to pick and choose. How, how did you, what did you do first when you decided to start scaling your meat, uh, your broiler operation? Uh, we got more coops, so that helped. And then um, that was a big learning curve because it was like, you got to make the relationships with the hatcheries now, you know, consistent birds, feed and logistics of getting feed here, which has actually been probably more of a nightmare this year than it has even in 2020. Get, getting feed here? Yeah, I just, you know, with gas prices up so high and everything like mm -hmm, that. but. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, di I didn't see any grain silos. Where are you storing your feed? It's all, we get almost all of our feed comes in uh, white one ton totes. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna go in there in just a little bit, guys, so you can see how he gets his feed delivered and where he stores it. Yep. Um, and we'll check that out in just a minute. So you, you scaled up your brooders, you found a good feed, uh, or your schooners, yep. you found a good feed source. Um, what about your brooder space? Yeah, so we are pretty lucky in that case. When we started here, we didn't practice what we now consider regenerative agriculture or pasture poultry. This was used for laying hens at one point <clears throat> for about a year after we built it and the chickens would just go out from it. And we learned very quickly that for 1200 chickens that were in here, that did not work. I mean, they just ate up the grass right around the barn mm -hmm. and maybe five to 10% would go out into the grass and that was about it. Mm -hmm. Most of them just stayed right here. Cause it was comfortable or yeah, I mean, that's where the food, uh, and, water that's where the food and water was. Chickens, they'll go after the grass and everything, but they want to be moved, you know, they want the shelter mm -hmm. because chickens come from jungle fowl and they're used to treetops. Mm -hmm. So they're not really, they're not like cows where they're really like out in the, you know, big fields all the time. Mm -hmm. They really enjoy the shelter of a, a roof. So being able to pull that around in the field right. is very nice. Yeah. So you were, you were using this as your brooder for your laying hens, right? Yep. Yeah. This was our hen house. Your hen house. So now, okay, gotcha. so, so it was an easy transfer. You know, we just transformed it into a brooder but, pretty easily. And we're going to go inside in just a second, guys. And you'll see he has, uh, how many chicks in there right now? 6,500. 6,500 chicks <laughs> yeah. in there. So keep watching guys. We'll show you some animals soon. I promise. Um, when I ask about this space on the back side yeah. of it, what, what is this designed for? So this is, uh, these are a week and a half right now. And then weather dependent at two weeks or so, we let them into, we have one on the other side too, that actually goes the whole length of the barn. Mm -hmm. um, they can come out into here and this kind of gets them used to sunlight, 
weather, whether it be rain, wind, temperature, and before we put them out to the pasture right. full time. Get them adjusted. Okay, so cool. So why don't we walk uh, over yep. here and check it out. So this is, this is where they'll spend the first three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so what age are these right now? Week and a half. Week and a half old. It's been three weeks in here, so another week and a half. So I guess yep. next week you may open up that door for yeah, them? Yeah, I'm thinking depend, depending on weather, we might even open those up maybe tomorrow or the next day. Mm -hmm. um, it really just comes to, we want to make sure that they can't slip out of the wire mm -hmm. um, and that they are have enough feathers or at least are big enough that they, if it, if it did start raining or something, mm -hmm. they'll so, be fine. So tell me about your setup here. Yep. Um, Let's just start from the ground up, right? Yes. So I see on the ground, it looks like you have a mixture of bedding material, Yep. right? Uh, what are you using here? Yeah, so in the spring, we can even step in here if you want. Yeah. In the spring, we start with cleaned out barn. It's a dirt floor though, so there's cement out here, but then it stops right here and it's dirt the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we start with a clean dirt floor, sand, and then we put a layer of peat moss down. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that is the brown that's stuff That's the brown stuff, yep. Here. And you can see it mixes in pretty good. So mm -hmm. it's all dry. Uh huh. That's the biggest thing is just dry. So you started with peat moss as your bedding? Yep. And for the first two or three batches, we used peat moss. Just this batch, we did um, wood shavings. And uh, the peat moss, though, I believe, don't quote me on this, but it can absorb something like 10 times its weight, where. Stand right there for yep. me. Yep. Thanks. Where um, wood shavings absorb twice their weight. Okay, so you got a lot more moisture. In the spring, we have more moisture um, in here, so that helps keep things dry. And that's why we went to wood shavings this time, just because it was more economical, and there's not near as much moisture as there was in the spring. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, and we don't clean it out in between batches. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a deep litter um, program, and then at the end of the season, then we'll come in here and clean everything out, compost it, and spread it. So yeah, thank you guys so much. And we did have a question. Yep. How did you switch to regenerative agriculture? Yeah, so I knew, well, as I started kind of getting into it, I watched a lot of Joel Salatin videos, um, and that's what he was practicing. Uh, I kind of thought it could be achieved from a barn, a stationary thing, by allowing the chickens to go out, and you learn pretty quick that that doesn't work. So as soon as I saw that that was not working, we pretty much made the jump in and put everything on movable, Everything moves now. out on pasture, out on rotation, pasture. moving yep. around. Why, why, why do you say it, did, it didn't work having them stationary? Um, because this isn't really regenerating anything. So mm -hmm. for the first three weeks, we're not. This isn't what I consider regenerative agriculture. Yes, we're taking good care of the animals. We're going to take their litter out at the end of the year and we'll spread it on the fields. That's all great. But the real impact is when they are out the last three, four, five weeks mm -hmm. out on pasture. Mm -hmm. regenerating the soil with their manure, with their impact, eating bugs, grass, worms, um, in unison with the cattle. Which is what folks down. will see later on, right? Exactly. Gotcha. Yep. So you guys keep watching if you want to see what he's talking about um, when it comes to regenerating his soil with the animals out on pasture. Yep. Um, okay, so if you have any questions about Joe's brooder space, uh, you know, feel free to get them in. We're gonna keep talking about it though. So you got your shavings, you got your deep yep. bedding method that you're using, yep. and you'll clean it out at the end of the season. Yep. Is that right? Yep. What is your poultry season here? Uh, I believe our first batch came in second week of March, and um, we get our last batch in on August 22nd, the last chicken leaves, I believe, October 13th. Nice, okay. So we've so, gone into November, mm -hmm. uh, but that gets kind of sketchy with mm -hmm. freezing temperatures and waters and stuff like that. Gotcha, so temperature is important. Talking about temperature, yep. what, what do you use to climate control in here? Yep, so we use these hover brooders. Um, they are propane and they are connected to a thermostat over there. So, um, I mean, you want me to just turn it on real quick and kind of show you how it turns on? Sure, yeah, let's do it. So I believe it's on, it's just the temp it's not reaching the temperature, so I'm going to turn it up. So this is the thermostat, so if we wanted it to stay at, let's say, 90 degrees, I turn that to 90. Mm -hmm. it flickers, 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 and turns on. Okay, so you got propane heat hoods yep. cooking so then, away. And then this dome pushes the heat down on the ground. Okay, gotcha. Um, so you have them spaced around the brooder here. Yes, exactly. Pretty evenly. Yep. There's um, been times where we have 
this cut into quarters sometimes, mm -hmm. or even in half, depending on what kind of chickens, you know, if they're different age groups, sizes, age, you know, breeds, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I noticed you got your feed and kind of the waters on the edges and then your feed is kind of spaced yep. around the heat a little bit so they're not right underneath it. Yeah, exactly. So this, at, by this, temp, uh, this age and the temperature it is outside, these hardly even need to be on. Um, but for the first five days, it's really important to make sure that they, you don't want them all crowded right underneath it. Mm -hmm. And you don't want them on the edges of the walls either. You kind of want them to make, we'll come in here after dark and you'll just see a big ring of chicks around each one of these and that's pretty much perfect. Gotcha, cool. We can shut that off, you don't gotta leave that running. Thank, um, you, thank you for demoing that. Yeah, for sure. Um, feeders and, so you got heat, what about air? Yep, so we use mostly just windows. We don't have any, uh, no, I'm not saying we shouldn't have anything, but we don't have any um, like uh, vents or anything that sucks air out. Well, you got, oh, I see, but you got, I mean, this garage bay door. Exactly, yep. Plenty of, I mean, it's nice and cool. And if it gets real hot, once they're older, we blow air in, which isn't necessarily always good. You don't want to do that on new chicks, like day old chicks. Once they're two weeks old, they're fine. Um, and then we can open up that back door too, and they get a huge breeze through here. So, gotcha. Uh, but first two batches, we, uh, we keep it locked pretty tight. We'll keep a few windows open mm -hmm. just to get some airflow. Um, but in March, it can be, you know, you can still get some freezing temperatures. For your chicks, what temperature do you like to keep it at? The first week between like 85 and 90. Mm -hmm. Fahrenheit. And then, yep, Fahrenheit. And then we start dropping it from there. And then we mostly go off of how the chicks seem more than specific temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, Just behavior. Put a rule of thumb. Yeah, behavior. Gotcha. Cool. So if they're all crowding up underneath it, you know you got to turn your heat up. And if they're just all on the edges of the walls, then you need to turn your heat down. Um, Kennedy Reynolds asked, are you able to raise any livestock during the winter? She imagines it's pretty cold in Michigan. Yeah. The only thing we keep, when we did hens, we had hens through the winter, uh, which can be kind of difficult. Um, and then we'll, we'll raise beef through the winter too. Gotcha. Nice. We just bring them hay and stuff. So. so what about your feeder and water setup? What are you doing? Yep. So this is a Ziggity water line. Um, nipple waters. Nipple waters, yep. Mm -hmm. So we've got a pressure reducer valve down there. So the water comes in, gets reduced pressure wise, yep. and it feeds this 50 foot long uh, water. And the chickens can just come up here and they find it within like 30 seconds of us putting the chicks out here. I, when we originally went from a, like a bell water to this nipple water, I thought it was gonna take some time for them to get used to it. Mm -hmm. They find it immediately. They, they like this shiny little thing and they just come up here and tap at it mm -hmm. and you can see it gets it just pours you know water out on your hand mm -hmm. and uh and it keeps it really i mean this how many you know under a water that's really dry yeah and and do you find this is enough having the two lines on the sides like um this? we actually have some that we haven't built yet i do think it'd be good to have two more lines uh, -huh. uh we're talking about getting some automatic feeders too but uh what i'd like to do is Water line, feed line, water line, feed line, water line, feed line, water line. Yeah, space, space yeah. it out. And then be able to bring them up to the ceiling would be nice too. Um, Keith Allen asked, how big is this brooder shed? This is uh, not including the like porch area out there. I believe just chick wise, it's um, 45 by 53. 40 or 45, 40, I can't remember. So f roughly 45 by 55, and then you're able to fit how many in here? Um, with the outdoor, so if we didn't have the leans, because uh, right now there's plenty of room, but in a, in a week and a half, they're gonna be a lot bigger. It's gonna be a lot tighter in here. That's what the leans, so with the leans, we get another uh, 55 by 24. Or you mean so. just the, is that the outdoor that's, space? Yeah, that's what I call the leans. The yep. leans. Sorry, okay. no, that, uh, that outdoor area, and um, a huge portion of them go out are out there all day long. Realistically, if you didn't have those, you'd probably only want to do about 4,500 to 5,500 in here. Yeah. Uh, but we can we can squeeze in that last thousand with those with those leans. That's awesome. Um, okay, so I, you told me a little bit about your feed, and we'll talk about the 
actual feed itself in a minute, but tell me about just the feeders themselves yep. that you're using and what your experience has been like with it. So day one, uh, we actually have paper right down the middle here, like a big um, cardboard looking paper. Like a roll of cardboard roll. that you just unroll. Exactly, mm -hmm. and we put them under the water lines too, so when the chickens walk on it, it kind of makes a creaking sound, mm -hmm. and the other chicks get excited and they want to come see what's going on, so then they find, that's another reason why they find the water so fast. Mm -hmm. But this middle one, and even under the water lines, we'll pour some feed on, mm -hmm. so it's right at eye level. Mm -hmm. And then we use, we have more, we've taken some out, we use these red trays, um, and uh, and then at about a week old, we start switching over to these feeders. Um, turbo I don't know, like, grow. Yeah, turbo. Yep. Turbo feeders. Yeah. yeah exactly. And nice. I think they hold maybe somewhere around 15 pounds, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and you refill them every day. Yeah, or multiple times a day, just depending on how much they're consuming. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then we've got some bigger red feeders over there. We're using some for our turkeys that we'll see in a little bit. Um, otherwise, we'd have about maybe 15 of those in here also. Super so cool. when those go out to the pasture next week, we'll take those feeders and bring them in here. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, keep, keep watching you guys, because here in just a minute, we're gonna go over to that barn and see all the turkeys and how he built his turkey brooder set up over there. Um, and it's a really cool space. The feed, though, I'm, I'm so impressed. Uh, you know, you are a no corn, no soy operation, yeah. right? Yep. 90, I would say 95% of what we produce is no corn, no soy. That's amazing. So, uh, and we're not organic certified, but our feed is. Mm -hmm. um, we get it from New Country Organics. Uh, this is a, a starter, so it's very, uh, it's like a mash almost. Mm -hmm. But uh, the grower that they get once they leave here is a lot more like a crumble. And we can see that too. Right, right here. here. You see the quality and consistency of that. There's no corn, no no soy. Looks like I see a lot of uh, grains in there, legumes, yep. some peas, wheat, peas. Wheat, yep, uh, fish meal. Oh, I was gonna take a bite until you said fish meal. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, it's no, it's good stuff, and they love it. And you know, we talked about that you're not using corn or yep. soy products, and you're doing, and and there's no GMO. Yeah. Um, Let's see, Keith Allen asks, why? Why is that important? So, first and foremost, I think the most important thing is the actual rotation of the animal. There's a lot of good, we do still produce some uh, chicken that has corn and soy in it for a certain customer. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I think that's the foundation, that's the best part. Mm -hmm. The no corn, no soy is like the next step. Um, personally, my conviction is we just have way too much corn and soy in our diet, mm -hmm. so it's a it's a it's a very I don't want to say easy, but relatively easy because you're eating the same product, but not getting those levels of well, estrogen can go up with a lot of soy. Um, but really, the reason we really got into it, to be honest, is because that's what the customer wanted. Customer demand. Yeah. And and I think they're probably demanding it because of what you said. Yeah. Um, we just have enough corn. In America, we have tons of corn and soy in exactly. our diets already. Yeah. Um, um, my wife's son and I, we went to Chicago to the um, Museum of Industry and Science, uh, Science and Industry, and there's a farming section, and there's, there's a, a part that talks about soybeans. Mm-hmm. And then it just starts showing, come through our, it was like, come through our house and see all the things soy is in. And it's in everything from all, like, all food products, especially like processed food products, mm -hmm. to hair gels, to, uh, you know, lubricants for engines, to everything. And it's just, people are trying to get it out of their diet more and more. Has it been hard to source that feed? Very difficult. Very yeah. hard to We find get our feed from feed. New Country Organics, um, mm -hmm. and uh, there's very few, uh, feed mills that'll do anything corn and soy for you. Wow. Yeah, so why don't we walk over there and show, show where you get that. Just while we're standing here, we can see the whole thing. Just tell me about the structure. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, we call it a hoop barn. I think they're called like a, I can't even remember, uh, something, but it's 50 by 112. Um, Pretty massive. Yeah, we originally built it for a winter housing for our hens. I'm gonna walk around on the side yeah, for so sure. people can kind of just see the, the depth of it here. You, so you originally built it for your winter hens, yep. you said? For but it's not insulated, was that a big deal? No. Okay. Uh, so what we, the only, hens will be fine actually in the cold as long as they can get out of the wind. Um, and they have 
uh, they can't have frozen water. So we built a frost-free water that um, the water was always flowing and it was heated. Right, okay. So, so as long as we out. could keep the water from freezing and they could get out of the wind, they were fine. They could still go out in the winter. Like we had a fence along here and back there and back there. Um, but they really only came out on nice days. Gotcha. They pretty much stayed inside. Okay, a great question here from Christine Hernandez, our livestock specialist at Heifer USA. Yes. Christine asked, um, she said, so impressive. She wants to know about what your workload is like with multiple species. Um, what are your hours like? How many folks do you have working with you? Yep, so I've got uh, three employees, um, and then I've uh, got a few people that full, help full out. Full-time or part-time? Uh, full, one part-time, two full-time. Okay. Um, and then my dad helps out a lot. Um, when we were washing eggs, my mom washed eggs all the time. Um, my workload's just a little bit all over the place. I mean, I don't have like a necessarily like an hour to hour thing, mm -hmm. um, but this is by no means a one man operation. Gotcha. So, I mean, they, are, Justin and Luke are here today and they got here at 7.30 and they won't leave until five. So, I mean, and, it, and in certain days, Especially when we load birds or we get chicks in, there's days we're here at four in the morning. There's days we're here at ten o'clock at night till midnight. It's kind of all over the place. But this is to gotcha. raise this amount. It's it's about a three to four full time people. Okay. Has it been hard to find labor? Uh, actually, for us, it hasn't been too bad. Um, we, Justin and Luke, both uh, we were actually um, youth group leaders. And they were both in youth group when we were leaders. Mm -hmm. And they both took a liking to the farm and what we were doing. And uh, they've worked here and then just friends. Community, uh, just yeah. your, your local community, folks you know. Yep, um, exactly. That good roots, that's awesome. Yeah, it's been, it's been really great. Good help is like super important. Okay, so th this space in here. Yep. Um, what is this? Tell me about the, the canvas here. And yeah, it's like a white canvas. It does heat up a little bit more in here during the day, uh, but not like it would if it was like a clear plastic, like a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and but it allows a lot of light in, which was really nice, especially for hens because hens light is so important for egg production. Gotcha. So um, it worked good for that. that makes now sense. it's honestly, I'm glad we built it, even though we're not doing hens, because now. We have feed to store, we have chicks to brood. Yeah, yeah, so we're gonna check out the, all this feed like we talked about, the turkeys over there, we're definitely gonna check that out. All right, so here's what we were talking about, the feed, right? This is where you yep. store your feed, this is uh, what it gets delivered in. Just tell me what we're looking at. Okay, so right here we've got um, our broiler feed. This is, uh, we've got our last batch of non-GMO, so this does have corn and soy in it. This comes from a local mill, community mm -hmm. mills. Guess Michigan, I see yep, there. Exactly, so it's about 25 minutes away. Mm -hmm. um, and then I believe we have uh, 1,500 of the turkeys we're raising are non-GMO with corn and soy. Mm -hmm. um, and that also comes from community mills. Let me see the label over here. I can just show folks what you're looking at here. Yep. Okay. So Pure, that's their non-GMO brand. Turkey starter for Joe Coopson. Nice. Ranger feeds. Yep. How do you say that? Cassopolis. Cassopolis, Michigan. Yep. Cool. Um, what's up with your milk jugs? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> our turkeys had some kind of gut issue. Mm -hmm. So um, Jeff Maddox from Fertrell suggested that we give them some milk. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to help soothe their gut. And um, I don't know all the science behind it. But Have you noticed any changes since you did it? I just gave the first dose last night. Mm -hmm. um, they do seem to be better. I mean, we did, uh, there was, a few less, because a few die every day right now mm -hmm. uh, when they're this age. From gut issues? Um, I think it has, so we went through, so when they're chicks, we had some die, and then we went through like a two week period where we had like hardly any die. Mm -hmm. um, and then we randomly started finding like three, four, five a day, and we were like, this isn't right. Um, and so then that's when Jeff Maddox suggested this, and we did have a lot less today. So. And Jeff Maddox, for those who don't know, pasture poultry guru, has yep. a ton of knowledge. Nutritionist. We've, mm -hmm. yeah. we, we've worked with him. He's got several really fantastic books yep. uh, that are available. Uh, so if anybody out there is like, where do I learn even more information and how can I yeah. get started? That's a great place to start, right? It is. His oh, books. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right, next over here. Yep, so this is our corn and soy free feed. Uh, this is the bulk of what we do now. Um, this comes in one ton totes. 
um, from New Country Organics. Um, Where are they out of? They have a mill in Virginia and in Texas. Um, so whichever is closest to you. Gotcha. Uh, they will ship it. Uh, I think they also ship 50 pound bags. So if you just have a small flock. Like that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And they'll ship it. Um, they cool. do, they're, they're an organic, uh, all their feeds are soy free. If you want corn free, that's a separate uh, special mix. And because of your customer demand, you're able to charge a premium because you're using this in part because you're using. This oh yeah, feed, this right? feed is like the most expensive feed you for can sure. Buy. Yeah, but you um, you can have the most expensive market item exactly because of it. Right? Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, so I, I would say the chicken we sell is probably one of the most expensive chickens on the market. Right. Yeah. Uh, for that reason, and just the the way we raise them is just way more labor intensive. And then your buckets here. Yep. So this is how we fill it. This is actually just straight wheat. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just, uh, we were adding this to some of the feed. Um, so it's funny, I don't think it's, but we can kind of see the top of it, maybe. So there's a spike here. Oh, That's yeah. actually a spout. So we set the, we picked the bag up with a tractor mm -hmm. and then we set it right on this spike mm -hmm. and there's a, an open spout mm -hmm. and we can we can lift it up in the air and fill we can fill about 80 buckets in 20 minutes okay so you're just making your own little gravity fed silo exactly. right yep. grain feeder yep. okay so you use forks on a tractor lift this bag up yeah it's got the already in there does it come in each bag kind of thing or what no so we oh, set that on the ground and we just set the bag on it and it I pokes see. through and then it stays in there it stays in there i believe it's called Fled bag. Mm -hmm. um, Let me just show that real close for folks so they can see that. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's in there pretty secure. Yeah. And then, what are we looking at here? That is our. Um, oops. You still hear me? I might need to plug it in all the way. It is it plugged in all the way? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's our corn and soy free broiler feed. Um, cool. That's more of the crumble. Mm -hmm. That's for the grower. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I can. Yeah, there's still too much in there for me to turn it around, but oh, yeah, right. it's just a lever. It's nice. pretty sweet though. Yeah. Uh, we do have a we have a video of it on our YouTube page if you guys oh, want to see that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You guys go check out Joe Coops. What's the YouTube channel? Uh, Joe's Farm. Joe's Farm. And then we've also got a channel that I have not. I've only done the intro video last fall, but we're hoping to do more on it called uh, Moving for Profit. Moving for Profit sounds yep. cool. Yeah. Well, so, may, might get some in, an influx of subscribers here. There soon. you go. Yeah. <laughs> the the idea behind the name was like moving like keeping animals moving and then for profit okay a couple of questions yep. um let's see the barn is massive how tall did you say um i don't know how tall it is it's very tall i would yeah, say 50 feet um, maybe 30 30 feet yeah, yeah that sounds right um where can muriel fournier who is a former heifer usa residential volunteer buy your pasture raised chickens so we do ship uh two day which gets us um down in the panhandle of florida into new york and then pretty much east of the mississippi um but our corn and soy free chicken you can get from uh primal pastures mm -hmm. um, we produce their all their chicken for them and they're an e-commerce e business they mostly are. right yeah. so primalpastures.com yeah, exactly go online order and they'll send it right to and you and it's a lot of their stuff comes. They from do Joe's nationwide. Farm. Yeah, all their chicken comes from us. But the same growing standard. Oh, all their chicken. All does. their chicken comes from us. Yep. Cool. And then um, they do nationwide shipping. Mm -hmm. And Apsi Farms, they're actually just two hours north of us. We just started working with them this year. And I believe in the summer they are only doing two day as well. But they uh, they use our chicken also. That's super cool. Uh, so curious how how you got their attention, or did they find you? Who's the, which one? Uh, uh, Primal. Yeah. So Primal, um, I was at an APA conference, I believe. I met Paul Grieve, who started Primal, and so we just kind of kicked it off with a friendship. And then they actually had their—they were raising their own, and the farm that they were leasing got sold. So they were looking for something, someone to just kind of fill in for a year. And then they decided to, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have a farm here that we raise some stuff on, but all of our chickens gonna come from Joe's farm. Nice, so APA, so, great place to make community APA is a great place, yep. for sure. So, and the, for those who don't know, that is the American Pastured Poultry Producers Associated. Association. Yeah, it's a mouthful. Cool, but, I think Heifer International had a, a role to play and help start APA a long oh, time nice. ago, actually, helped provide yep. some capital a little bit, or some funding and organizational. So, 
All right, what, are, what are all these yep. guys are just hanging out. Like, yeah. talk, talk about <laughs> us. Talk about so this us. is a thrown together brooder with many different pieces of wood and fencing. Um, but we brought one of our waters in here, one of our water lines, and then a bunch of our feeders, and we've got some hand waterers also. Um, this is the last of what was in here. There were about triple this when they were little. Mm -hmm. um, and we had more heaters and stuff like that. Um, but all of their, these are all Toms. So all their brothers are already out on pasture. Um, we have two different feed programs for turkeys, a non-GMO with corn, and then a corn and free organic. Mm -hmm. It looks like a turkey playground. Yeah, no pretty lie. much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me about some of these playground-like structures. What's up with, I mean? So a lot of this was really just to hold up the water line. Okay. Um, obviously you can see they're using it to roost on now. Um, but we do try to give them as much roosting space as possible because unlike broiler, chi broiler chickens, for meat, they won't really roost much, but uh, a turkey will, mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, like a hen chicken for eggs. They'll, they'll get up and they'll roost on things up until you bring them to the processor. So that's, that's actually a real big benefit, kind of gets them up off the ground at night, which is helpful. So um, this wasn't designed, obviously, to be a turkey brooder. No, this what, is the first time we've ever brooded in here. Why, why did you do that? Why did you do it? We just here? needed the space. Yeah. Yeah, we needed the brooder space, and we didn't want to brood. Last year, we made the mistake of brooding turkeys where we had brooded chickens just a few weeks before, and our turkeys ended up getting a disease called blackhead, which they get from chickens. From bacterial diseases, yeah. that kind of thing? Okay. Yep. So... It ended up running its course through our flock that year, and it put a pretty, I think we lost maybe 20 or 30 percent of our flock to Blackhead. Black yeah, okay. So we didn't want to mess around with that this new, year. New space. Yep, so we just brought them in here where no chickens had been. How many turkeys are you doing this year? Uh, 2,500 to 3,000. Awesome. That's, yeah. that's, that's quite a bit. And do you sell all those before Thanksgiving? So, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so we... Our farm is mostly, uh, we work with other retailers. Uh, very little of what we do is actually direct consumer, which we're actually trying to grow that side of things. Um, but uh, we get purchase orders for all the turkeys we raise. Very nice. So they're already pre-sold. We'll, we'll do like maybe 50 to 100 for ourselves yeah. to sell direct consumer. Mm -hmm. But the rest of these are going to like Moink Box, uh, are taking a bunch of turkeys, Primal, Oregon Valley Meats in Oregon. Um, Seven Sons, we're looking at getting them some too. So, uh, lots of demand lots out of, there. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of different retailers are, I'm, you know, they're actually looking for legitimate pasture raised. I think that makes sense, though. You know, when when people buy a whole turkey, like it's for a special occasion yep. most of the time, right? And exactly. so, I think people are w would be willing to, you know, pay that premium because it's so a too, special yeah. occasion, you know, and it's a big purchase. So exactly, that makes sense. So cool. So you kind of got. You know, you made your own walls in here. Yep. Just threw your bedding down. You got the same kind of operation where you got feeders and waterers. Yeah. Some places for them to roost. I see you got heat lamps back over there, yep. right? And, and go ahead. I was just gonna say turkeys. I I pointed out how dry it was under the water line in the chicken brooder barn. Turkeys are not that way. They make a mess with the water. So about every other day we go through and we pour a bunch of new wood shavings just right under the water line. Yeah, I do see, I don't know if folks at home can see, but it is mounded up a little bit right yep. there. So that's from us putting fresh dry stuff on top just to keep it clean. Because they, they, they splatter it almost like a, if anyone's raised ducks. Ducks make a big mess. They're not as bad as ducks but uh, they make more of a mess than the chickens do for sure. Okay, we got a bunch of questions coming in we're Sweet. gonna get to in just one second, but I wanna ask you also about the feeders. You said uh, you got bigger feeders in here. Yep. Um, tell me about those. So these are just a 30 or 35 pound coal feeder. They're obviously not at the level they should be at. That's why they're wasting some. Yeah. Uh, we just don't have any way to hang them in here really. Gotcha. Uh, once these turkeys go out in the pasture, they'll have bigger, like kind of like what's in the middle there, like a range feeder. Mm -hmm. Uh, which we'll see out there. All right, I got you, okay. Yep, and, uh, but we, <clears throat> as you grow a business, you kind of just use what you got, too. So yep. it's definitely not the most efficient, but these little red feeders will bring into the chicken brooder barn when these are out and the chickens can use them. Super cool. Are you, what, what is your plan? So are you going to use this again next season? I'm not sure yet. Um, we're talking about building another brooder barn. We're also talking about, um, some local farmers that might have like a retired pig barn or something, just leasing that from them and brooding in there. Um, 
This is an ideal. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Turkeys are hard to brood. They they like to get. They like to pile on top of each other. They like to, you know, not be where they're supposed to be. So it would be nice to have a much more tightened up, you know, better brooder for turkeys for sure. But if we did if we did use it again, we could make some changes that would make it a lot easier for next year too. Right. Gotcha. So wait and see. Yep. Okay. Um, Let's see, so Lisa Holiday asked a little bit ago, how do you keep your buildings predator proof? Maybe what kind of predators do you deal with in this area? Yeah, so we've been really fortunate. Um, we've got woods and swamp 50 feet from this barn. And, um, yeah. oh yeah, yeah yep. that's good. And uh, we have not had any predator issues in our brooders, mm -hmm. which is kind of surprising because a raccoon could easily get in here if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's enough kind of going on around here that they're not super inclined to want to come up here. We don't even see any up by our house or anything. But out in the field, we do have dogs that um, protect the chickens. Okay. The you, you, okay. So you have livestock guardian dogs yep. out there. Okay. Yes, exactly. Cool. I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so not too many predator issues. Um, out in the field, hawks are our biggest issue. So the dogs really help with those. And I lost the questions. Let me pull those back up. Hawks. Yep. You said? Okay. Yeah. But you don't have any tigers, bears, cats, any no. big animals. Coyote Coy would be the biggest thing. Uh, we haven't had a few coyote attacks. If the, you know, when we had laying hens, <clears throat> we did lose a uh, large sum to some of those. But other than that, I mean, we haven't had any problems. But I know that it could be a problem for some people. Okay. All right, there's the questions. Okay, uh, how many turkeys? So we, we answered, you said you're growing how many thousand a year? Uh, 2,500 to 3,000. 2,500, and then This how is many? probably only about 700. Okay. The rest are out on pasture. These are going out on pasture. Um, we just have to get their house done. And these are about five and a half weeks old. So we really want to get them out on pasture before seven weeks if we can. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, LC Farmer said he, he's watching from a little bit ago, but uh, he noticed that your brooder and our brooder at Heifer Ranch have high ceilings. Is there any reason for that? That's a good observation. So we didn't, since we're not from a farm, I didn't come from a farming background or anything. What he's probably um, alluding to is poultry barns are built with low ceilings. Because when you brood a chicken, you don't want to heat all that air so high. Um, we actually kind of like the tall ceilings just for getting in and out and you know stuff yeah, like that because you got to scoop the bedding out at the end of the year exactly so you but, get the tractor in there but from a from a efficiency standpoint a, small, a shorter ceiling would be a lot less to heat that makes sense yeah that's a good observation for sure thanks you LC farmer for that great question um, Lisa holiday asked uh, when you take poultry to the fields, how do you keep it predator proof? And we'll, we'll probably cover that when we get out there. Yep, and right? I can walk us past some things. We do use some crates and we use uh, actually a dump trailer that works actually really well for turkeys. Oh, really? Yep. Sounds cool. Okay, yeah, so uh, we're going to head out there, I think, just in a, just a few minutes. So, Lisa, if you can hang out with us, we'll definitely show you uh, what he does out on pasture to keep it predator proof. For sure. Um, so yeah, it's great. Um, Sun Kim, a little while ago, asked, do you do any deworming and vaccination? We get that question a lot, especially from our yep. international audience where uh, it, it's not, it may not be the same. They may be dealing with different disease and exactly. pests and stuff like that. And so you tell me. Yeah, though. so for around here, for our farm, we don't, none of our poultry has any vaccines and we don't do any dewormers. Um, the only thing that ever gets a vaccine are our dogs. We, got, we have to get the rabies vaccine, mm -hmm. um, but we don't even vaccinate um, our cattle or deworm them or anything either. And so your chicks don't come vaccinated from the hatchery? We, we have to specifically get them not vaccinated. Really? Yep. And why do you do that and what's been your experience with it? Um, we just kind of found it unnecessary. So with the way we're raising them with plenty of space and then when they're out in the field being moved off of their manure every single day, we have hardly any disease load, healthy like living disease or anything. So, so just healthy living conditions yeah. don't get as di uh, disease as much. Right? Exactly. Yep. Those vaccines, as far as I know, were pretty much developed because they knew chickens were now going to be stationary, sitting in their own kind of, you know, waste for the entire life that they could mm -hmm. get some respiratory problems or whatever. 
Nice, nice. Well, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Thanks for the great question, Sun Kim. Um, okay, so anything else you want to tell us about this space? I don't think so. Um, that pretty much covers all the turkey brooding. Okay, well, you want to and, and take a walk and show yes. what you said outside? And sure. So now we are going to walk over to um, where you have your schooners out on pasture. Yep. So we're going to imitate the life of these birds and leave the brooder. Yep, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and go out on pasture. We got a little sunlight coming out, shining, feeling good. And I noticed, uh, yeah, you got a bunch of crates that yeah. you were just talking about, right? That's right. So that's the dump wagon right there on the left. Mm -hmm. um, we can put a cover on that and shoo turkeys in there and bring them out to the pasture. Or we use all these for our chickens and we can use them for turkeys. So for, these... getting, for getting them out on pasture, these yep. are the two methods that you've used? Yes, okay. and, and bringing them to the processor also. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, Let's go on this side real quick if you yep, don't mind. Sure. Um, Not right in the sun, maybe. Oh yeah, and so we can also talk about this. Yep. So we use these chicken crates when we go to the processor. Um, we'll have this whole trailer out in the field. A tractor will come pick this whole pallet of, um, of crates up, mm -hmm. set them outside the coops, and then we bring the chickens to the crate. Uh, we stack them on these, and the tractor picks them all up. So we used to carry before we had all this set up and a tractor. We did, uh, for many years, we did all this without a tractor. I, I think you're gonna make my colleagues pretty jealous right now. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> when we do it, I, I'm pretty sure um, we're, we're still loading them one at a time. I could be wrong. Yep. I haven't done a chicken catch in a, a little while, but yeah. um, it's a labor intensive process, right? It is. So yeah. whatever you can do to kind of mitigate that, mm -hmm. for the longest time we were using this to move chickens to the processor, and we would pick up each crate full of chickens and that just gets kind of back. We still do that sometimes, depending on if they're going, what process they're going to. But this is the majority of how we do it. And we can fit 1,500 broiler chickens on this trailer. Okay, nice. And how many per crate? Seven to eight. Nice, that's yep. pretty good. These are big too. They're, they're, they are a little bit bigger than the normal ones. Mm -hmm. um, these are, Coal Corporation makes these. Uh, and they're pretty good, we like them. Okay, so you, you used, and then um, did you say, you said you used these for predators somehow? Prevention? Uh, no. Or I miss her. Okay. Uh, not for predator, um, but we do use them to move them from the brooder barn. Yep. From the brooder, gotcha. And you said you've you've just shuffled them into the back of the trailer. We have, here yeah. Too. So we've we've brought them uh, in here and just set the turkey. We don't use this for chickens, but for turkeys, we have put them just in here mm -hmm. and then brought them out to the pasture. Also. How does that work? Uh, it works pretty good. We'll still just pick them up one at a time mm -hmm. and bring them in here. Uh, I don't know exactly how many we can get in here when they're five or six weeks old. When they're a, like full grown, we can get like, and we go three and a half hours to the processor, we put 80 of them in here. So That's normally cool. this has yeah. a, another wall on it. It broke, we gotta fix it. But. Gotcha, gotcha. Neat. Yeah, cool. it works out really well. All right, which, which way to the pastures? Right through here. Awesome, what a beautiful farm out here. This is just gorgeous too. Yeah, it's a great day too. Yeah. We got lucky on that. All right, uh, while we're walking guys, we're gonna answer your questions. Um, and whatever million more I can think of, because I'm just fascinated by this. Um, yep, Jeremy King mentioned, you know, using a mobile coop and electric fence. Do you have your uh, any of your perimeter fencing set up out here? Um, like turkeys? Oh, no, we don't. Okay. Um, Lisa Holiday says, she lives on 40 acres and was wondering how to get started raising her own meat chickens and what advice you would give to a newbie with 40 acres. Well, 40 acres is a lot of property. Mm -hmm. That's uh, If it's... Yeah, if it's pasture, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how much of it's pasture, wood, swamp. Mm -hmm. um, but this this whole farm is only 46 that we're on right now. Oh, okay, so very comparable. Yeah. 46 acres here. Yeah, I think we've got about, in grasslands, pastures, we've got about 20, and the rest is made up in woods and swamp. So, depending on how much of it is usable, uh, if you're just getting started, if I'm not sure if it's like for personal use or if you want to kind of make a go of it as far as a business. I think she wants to start uh, Lisa Holiday Farm. Okay, there you go, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, we started with, like, our first batch of meat chickens I think was like 50. I think that's, a, and that's <clears throat> how a lot of different farms start off. It's like, that's a good size. That's like, if you can't sell them, mm -hmm. you can eat them. Mm -hmm. If you get too many more than that and you find out you can't sell them, then it's a lot to 
and yeah. you just sell them to your friends and family, neighbors, yep. local grocers, exactly. whoever, where, go to Mark Farmers Markets, whatever you yep. can do just to get your name out there and your product out exactly. there, right? And it starts building the brand and then you can kind of grow it from there. And actually, Lisa, um, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button because we have a great video called How to Start a Regenerative Farm from Scratch that might just be what you're looking for. You awesome. we, we, um, we basically interviewed the Jacksons in just outside of Durham, North Carolina, toured their farm, and they had just been in operation for a little over a year, close to two, I think. And uh, yeah, check that video out, Lisa. You might get some, after this live stream is over, you might get some more information there. Um, so you got a per perimeter fence established? Yep, so yeah. we actually, we didn't, we just got into the cattle business last year. So this is a relatively new fence. Mm -hmm. um, we put one up ourselves and we didn't have the right equipment to do it. So the cattle kept getting out. So we paid a, uh, an Amish company that do a great job putting these up and they just come in and they just pound these right into the ground. It works so well. Nice. Um, so this has made our lives so much easier. We do uh, woven wire on the outside, and then we have uh, three strands of electric on the inside. So we can tap into this for rotating our cattle, uh, it keeps the dogs in. So you got electric? Yep, cool. uh, top, middle, and bottom. Okay, nice. Yeah, and we can we can uh, turn one or uh, we can have all on or just have the top on or just depending on size of the animals. Yep, exactly. Stuff like that. Very nice. Okay, Surya Kumar is watching from India. Thanks for watching, Surya. Um, she asked about the feed management and just what you do or what, any advice you would have on just what you need to think about when you're trying to manage your feed yep. effectively. What can yeah. you do to limit that? It's really important. So you definitely want to make sure you're doing first in, first out. So if you're ordering more feed, you want to use up the old feed first because if you don't or something gets pushed back, you don't want to use super old feed. Mm -hmm. You want to use it as fresh as possible. Um, keeping it dry is also really important. If you if it gets wet, it'll mold really fast mm -hmm. and you don't want to be feeding chickens moldy feed. Um, other than that, the handling of the feed, especially in this industry, is a big topic to try to cut down on labor as much as possible with feeding. Um, I would say 50% of the day for the two full-time employees is feeding chickens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so as much of that as you can cut down as possible, just making it easier to get the buckets out there. Or there's operations which we're going to experiment with and we'll kind of talk about later with automatic feeders out in the pasture. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> if you're talking smaller scale, just making sure that the chickens are eating through the feeders mm -hmm. and they're not just letting it sit in there too long and that the feed is at the right height too right because like Correct. we just saw in the turkey brooder you they're know, wasting you, some because it's low because it's too low they have to go all the way down and try to pick it up and then swallow yep. it where if it's at right at their shoulder height right yep they can just easily get to it without moving their head a bunch exactly shoulder height so pretty much if it's a chicken you pretty much want to like draw a straight line from their you know their tail feathers on their back right through their neck and that's where you want the feeder height to be. Awesome. Um, question from Sun Kim asked about uh, what, what in your experience has been the best breeds for laying hens? Uh, we like the Isa Browns and then a lot of different um, offsets from them for different hatcheries. Oh, like What is that? Isa Brown. Eyes of Brown? Yep, okay. I-S-A and then uh -huh. Brown. Oh, Eyes of Brown, gotcha. Um, but there's offsets like High Line. Uh, we had a lot of High Lines. Um, I can't even remember all. There's like four or five different. Where did you source them? Uh, we got some, we usually got started pullets. Mm -hmm. So we got some from Moyer Hatchery. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got some from uh, some local farms that had them too. Hey, here comes a friend. Yeah. Hey, buddy. And uh, so, oh, all right, we talked about this a little earlier. You got some of your. Oh wait, we gotta say hi. Hello. Hey, buddy. Hello. You doing? His a good brother's job? not very happy because his brother actually killed the turkey yesterday oh no so he's tied up he they're both literally puppies. in the doghouse right now yep probably. yep so he's not happy that he can't run <laughs> over here hi, hi. hello okay okay um yeah sounds like he's in the doghouse yep. sure. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah why, why do you have these out here so these are our old uh lang hens um houses 
and we are going to use them for the turkeys when they get older. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll move them around the pasture with the coop that's back here. And uh, why would why would you do that? Uh, it just provides more shelter and shade. Okay. Yeah. And um, turkeys need that. Yeah. So they don't need uh, the shelter is not actually as once they get past like eight weeks, the shelter is not as important as the shade. The shade is really what's important, and then it also the shelter is more to just keep their feet dry. Gotcha. Um, let's see here. Another great question. So this is from Sam Noble, who is our poultry production specialist okay. at Heifer Ranch. Nice. Um, and she asked, what ways do you prepare your poultry on pasture for bad weather, such as heavy rain and winds? Yep, that's a great question. We can so, talk about that while we go yeah. over there. Um, so our coops have side curtains that if it's gonna rain, we'll close those. <laughs> and um, the wind, we don't have much of a wind problem. We've never had any of our coops shift or blow or anything, <clears throat> but farms around here have, and they stake them down. If they know there's gonna be a bunch of wind, mm -hmm. um, they'll throw some T-posts uh, down and strap them to them, and that has really helped a lot. Um, and then what about uh, rain? Do you get torrential rains or anything like that you gotta deal with? Yeah, if there's a big enough thunderstorm or something, um, it, it doesn't look too low lying here. Though. No, we so don't, have, any don't have a lot of standing never water had flooding. or flooding. Nope. Yeah, it's a good place. You got, you know, you can see you got slow. I mean, it does dip down there, but if it's not standing water, yeah, you know, you're fine. But you got good terrain here. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for tuning in, Sam. Glad you're watching with us. Um, Okay, Jeremy King says, have you ever done fermented feed? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we have not. Um, at our scale, it's, the benefits that we've seen from other test trials don't seem necessarily worth it for mm -hmm. labor-wise, but if we were small scale, then I might actually do that. Gotcha, yeah. And what is fermented feed for those who don't know? Yep, so just like, um, I mean, all sorts of different fermented things like sauerkraut or pickles or something. Uh-huh. <clears throat> The fermentation helps with uh, gut biome. Oh, um, there's, there's our friend in the doghouse over yeah. there. Hey, buddy. <laughs> He's like, come on. <laughs> I'm afraid if I don't let him off, he might bark the whole time. If he, so he's it's barking, just, we'll let him off. It's just the same kind of feed you saw, only it goes through a fermentation process. Yep, so you get it process. wet, and you stir it, and you wait, I don't know, it's something like three or four or five days. And then you feed it to the chickens, the turkeys. And, and you said that that can help improve gut health and yeah, exactly. uh, probiotics, just like humans. Right? Exactly. We, we consume fermented food for that. So cool. Yep. Um, so tell me about what we're looking at. Yep. So this is our turkey coop. Uh, this was one that was used for hens for a long time. Um, when it had hens in it, we didn't have any of this wire on the side. Now we have wire on it. And these are only going to just, they'll come out from the coop in about a week or two. We're just keeping them in there right now while they're still kind of young. And then we'll have perimeter fencing, like the white Polytech, or not Polytech, um, premier fencing around it. Okay. Um, and then that's when we'll start incorporating the A-frames back there too. Okay, gotcha. So you'll put perimeter fencing around this, you'll let the, them start day ranging, yep. give them the, what you're using is basically mobile shade, yeah. right? Using your, hen, your old uh, hen coops for that. Um, Okay, and then how many turkeys do you have in here? So in here we've got about 900 actually, mm -hmm. um, which again, if they were, we would never be able to fit that many if they weren't going to go out from it mm -hmm. eventually, because we have raised some in in these coops where they just stay in the coop, and um, we had 200 and that was perfect. Oh, okay, gotcha. So if you were if you didn't want a day range, I would say 200 in a coop this size. If you're day ranging plus we're going to have the A frames, I think we'll be all right with 900. Yeah, you want to poke our heads in? Can we poke yeah, our heads in? Yeah, sure. So you can see, this is what it's all about. You can see where they've been. Yep. We move them every day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so down. earlier, if you guys are just now tuning in um, or f forget what we're talking about, um, somebody asked earlier, you know, about why regenerative agriculture yep. or why, why raise, you know, the way that he's doing it here. And this is the answer. Isn't that, isn't that <laughs> I mean, just look at that. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's that you move them. You, you keep them healthier by moving yeah. them to fresh pasture, and you're improving the quality of your soil. I mean, there's so much nitrogen yep. in, in, in this manure, tons of other good things for the soil. And that, the actual impact of the chicken scratching, um, you know, pecking at the ground, that also improves So a that, lot. That, that helps that stuff get in there. Exactly. Um, yeah. So move this every day. 
You move it every day? Every day. Yeah. Nice. Every single day. All of our structures get moved every day. If you let them sit for more than that, depending on how many are in there, it just gets too much. Right. Too much nitrogen in one spot. Very cool. All right, let's take a look inside the turkey schooner. Sorry, buddy, you, you can't come in. Sorry. Yep, you stay out there. <laughs> <laughs> so this has uh, some big feeders right down the middle. Then we've got four other feeders right here on in the corners. Mm -hmm. Then we've got a water line that goes down the edge. Uh, we've got parts to hang more waters. They're coming in the mail right now. Mm -hmm. So for now, we're using these um, hand waters also. So tell me about uh, these large feeders in the middle. Why do you have it set up like this? And this is how we had it set up for our hens. Uh, so we're testing it out to see if it works for the turkeys. Seems to be working all right. They're not all getting the hang of jumping up here to eat. So that's why we added these feeders in the corners. Um, but they're starting to get the hang of it more and more because they're at first when we added these, they were just getting emptied very fast. But now it's starting to slow down. That means they're coming up here and eating a lot more feed. Mm -hmm. at least. But it, it goes with the coop. So that's you couldn't hang this. This will hold, I think, 300 pounds of feed. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't hang that. So it's really nice to have it set on there. And it just moves with the coop. Okay, I got a couple cable issues. Can you hold that for just a second? Yep, sure. And then I'm going to check on the back back here, guys. I know the, the colors are flickering just a little bit. And I want to make sure that all the cables are secure so you don't have to keep looking at that. Okay, hopefully that will help improve it a little bit. See any good questions on there? All right. Okay, so yeah, they're, and they're they're kind of raised up. Is that intentional? Is it just so you can move them? Yeah, so it moves them without like crushing any turkeys or chickens or anything. Um, and then if you got on uneven ground or there's a hump in the ground, you're not scraping it and beating it up. And either. then and then these you just basically zip tied these on here. Yep. And they're obviously just hanging out, roosting a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they'll sleep on them, roost on them, mm -hmm. play on them. Nice. And then I see over there you got the trays with the milk. Yep. We talked about this earlier. Why are you doing milk? Uh, um, they've again? just got some. They've got some gut problems right now, so we've we're adding the milk just to help with their gut mm -hmm. and intestine and stuff like that. How do you get in here to fill these feeders? Uh, we do it all through the doors. Uh -huh. We just bring buckets right in and just dump them in or bags or whatever the feed comes in. Okay. Um, there are uh, Seven Sons has coops like this, mm -hmm. and they actually have a. Uh, tubing system that goes up to uh, one t thing at the top and they have an auger that'll drop the feed in there. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty slick. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure to do that right now. But and then waterer right here, right? Yep. Nice. And then we've also got automatic water line over here. Okay, on that side over yep. there. So they don't use those as much, you know, we would have to have a lot more of those if we didn't have the automatic water. Yeah, show me about this corner over here. You got quite a bit going on, it looks yeah. like. Yeah, so. When we had hens, again, this is still kind of left over from the hens. This is our a dog feeder. Then the dog would come in here and eat and drink. That's not really being used anymore. Um, and then that fills up with water and that's enough pressure to fill that whole line and they can get it right out of those nipple waters right there. Okay, so what's in there? Just water. Just a tub of water? Just a tub of water. Oh, okay, it's I on see. a float valve. Oh, okay. So, yeah, let's see, this is unique. I like this. So that, so when that when it gets low, it uh -huh. fills up, and then that pressure just from being up a little bit higher mm -hmm. goes through those tubes and goes right. You can see it coming out. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a gravity-fed system. Exactly. Gotcha. And then you got a tank here. That's pretty neat. I like that. Yeah. And then this is for the dogs too. It was. It's not. They don't use these anymore. I, I was curious. Do they come in? Do they actually come they in? They don't here? come in here much. Maybe when they free, uh, day range, they will. Um, those two are puppies. They're not completely trained yet. Their parents um, uh, are really good, though. They could come in here no problem. Um, yeah, somebody asked earlier about how you how it was Jeremy King asked how you house your field dogs um, and just you know how you raise yep. them to live outside. So we yeah we've we got some of those little hog huts mm -hmm. and we walked by them, but we can show you again, yeah. Jeremy, on our way out of here. For sure. um, 
So Martin's, so yeah, if you guys are just tuning in, we're tour, touring Joe's farm uh, live here in Three Rivers, Michigan, checking out his pastured poultry operation. Soon uh, we'll go check out his cattle um, and answering your questions live throughout the broadcast. So you want to know anything, just type it away and I'm, I'm reading them all right here. There you go. And if you're watching the recorded version of this broadcast, you can... <laughs> Just type your questions down in the comments below and we'll answer all of those as well. So more to come guys, as long as you guys wanna hang out with us, um, we're gonna be checking out the rest of the schooner operation. We're going to check out the cattle. Um, there is another parcel of land that Joe uh, owns and, and manages that has even more of these schooners um, that we might go check out. And we're gonna look at Joe's farm store where he sells uh, some of his product as well so you can see what the finished package looks like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lots more to come. Stick with us. If you can't watch for the whole live stream, please feel free to just come back to this video right wherever you left off. The, the broadcast will be available for later viewing after we're done here. Um, okay, here's a great question. Kobe Chase Farm Company has raised 600 broilers completely on pasture this year behind poultry netting. He had no hawk issues until recently, but he wants to know um, do your guardian dogs deter the hawks? They do, yeah. Yeah. That's honestly the, probably the number one because you can keep, like he said, with fencing, you can keep coyotes and raccoons out relatively well, but um, hawks and owls are a big problem. So the dogs, just their presence really keeps them all away. Gotcha. Cool. So yeah, great, great question there. Um, Ellen Brown, my, my, my co-worker at Heifer USA asked, um, how do you fill all the feed bins so these i think she's talking about these and yep I, I had asked i was curious about the same thing you literally come in here and just just jump dump, buckets of feed in and you kind of got this set up i'm gonna show people yep um this is just a lid that's just a lid yep keep keep the moisture out and then you just pour it in there yeah and um is this are you dumping five gallon buckets or is it the bag feed that goes so in when there? we had hens in here is all bags uh now it's um five gallon buckets yeah awesome um What's your website? Jeremy Joesfarm.us. Joesfarm.us. Kennedy, if you can type that in the chat for folks so they have it, and we'll put it in the description of this video as well. Anybody who is curious to learn more about Joe's Farm, purchase his product, have it shipped to your door. Uh, we'll put links in the chat as well so you can try all of these amazing proteins that Joe is raising to the uh, just the highest standards. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, yeah, Jeremy likes that water system just as much as I do. It's pretty Yeah, amazing. it's pretty it's pretty nice. Okay. Right. All right, if you guys have any more questions from inside, let us know. We're going to step out and I got a couple about the outside. Yeah, it's, I'm not pretty tight. <laughs> A little bit warmer in there. It is, yeah, a little bit. Right now, just because of the air, I think. Yeah. Uh, but you have something up we there. We have a 80% shade cloth on top. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be really hot in there if we didn't have that on it. Mm -hmm. um, Where do you source your shade cloth? And, and I mean, it's just, I think you, you put it on there to control temperature, right? Yeah, so the shade cloth came with the kit. This is our kit. Um, and we actually have, we actually I, sell things I, now too. Um, we sell a lot of this equipment on PasturePoultryEquipment.com, mm -hmm. um, but hen gear. You sell it? We do. Yep. Oh, PasturePoultryEquipment.com. Yep. If you want to buy one of these kits, can you? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So if you are interested, do you have smaller kits for folks starting out? Uh, we sell a. I think the smallest one is still 36 by 20. Okay. This is 48 by 20. And how many fit in a 36 or in, in the smaller one? Uh, you could do as many as 500. Okay. So if you're just watching, you want to get started, or if you're watching, you've already been doing it, you want to scale up a little bit and you're looking for a place to source some equipment, that website is? PasturedPoultryEquipment.com. PasturedPoultryEquipment.com. Yep. Cool. Um, and we've, we're also experimenting with a feeder that I think is going to be, um, it's going to help with efficient, you know, feed conversion rate too. Um, we don't have those for sale yet, but we're getting interest from people that might want to pre-order or something like that. Oh, nice. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so what else you got over here? Yep. You got a different design, I see. Yeah, so that's our, that's the first coupe we used. Uh, that one is God, 36 by so 20. Curious. You gotta leave <laughs> us alone, dog. Here, I'll show you that. You know, that's a different experience for me. Our, our dogs at the, at Heifer Ranch, um, they'll, they come to some people, but we really try, I try, I try to stay away from them. Yeah. You know? There's a part of me that kind of wishes that a little bit with our dogs. But um, it's a dog. It's so cute. Look at you. Hi. Hi. And you do such a great job, I'm sure. 
So this is a new feeder we're trying out. Uh huh. Uh, it kind of has that pan at the bottom that like commercial guy use. It doesn't do as well with this mash as it does pellet feed. Uh huh. But uh, what what is the efficiency or what is the well, specialty of the design? Well, the, the spout at the top keeps you from spilling feed on the ground. So you see how it gets wider at the top here, uh -huh. where something like one of those feeders gets narrower. One of these get yep. narrower at the top, yeah. Yeah, wider. So it's harder to pour in, right? It's harder to pour and in, and it spills out everywhere. Yeah, and then these keep them from flinging the feed out. Because uh, they have to go straight in and straight out. In. They can't just yeah, go. They can't fling it out. So that makes sense. I like We're that. This is our only one we have. We're experimenting mm -hmm. with it, and then we'll have them for sale if anyone's interested. And in, you know, well, I'm not sure if it's because we scared them away, but nobody's over here. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it was this mash feed, didn't fall through, it's so through, I just no. filled it back up. Okay, but, nice. Uh, crumble feed goes through it nicely. That's a cool design, though. I like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, there's not many farms using that. They're, like, I had to look really hard to find it. Uh, so that's why I thought it would be kind of cool to... Okay, and, and somebody earlier, I think it was Lisa Holiday, asked about predator protection. Yep. Um, out on pasture, you say you got the livestock guardian dogs. What about your structure here? Yeah. What are you doing? So right now we use rubber at the front here, mm -hmm. uh, and this so this will kind of contour with the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and then if, if we miss a turkey while we like while we're moving them, we always have someone in the back uh, kind of shooting them along. Yeah. And if we miss one, they just kind of they don't get hurt because it's just rubber. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sides we have we have all this fencing. Um, but chicken, the dogs, chicken wire. yeah, yep. the dogs still do 99% of the jo job because, as you can see, a coon or something could yeah, still doing his job out there right now. Yep, <laughs> could still get in here if they really wanted to. Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, this is wide open right here. So. Yeah, honestly, that that I think that tells you that the dogs are doing a great yeah. job. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Awesome. We don't really have much of a predator problem, honestly. It's it's been great. Um, yeah. Um, Our dogs in training are more of a concern than even just predators. Okay, lots of questions about your schooner design here. Yep. Um, so Mark Motorman asked, you know, did you make these or did you purchase them? And you said that you purchased them. Yep, they're built kit. kits. Yeah. And you can, if you want to get these to yourself, it's pasturedpoultryequipment.com. Yep. Ellen Brown asked, how often do you have to come out and fill your feed bins in there? Um, depends on age. So right now we, we bring like eight buckets out a day, mm -hmm. but when they are going to be full grown, we'll have more feeders once they go out too, but we'll probably have to bring, we'll probably try to do an every other day thing and we'll bring 80 to hundred buckets out. Wow. So, a yeah. day? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Feeding, feeding can become a... You need a, you need a grain silo or something yeah. that just... Psh, or and that's something. why we're trying to work on some kind of automatic feeding system. Gotcha. Um, Okay. For that new coop. Um, yeah, so Jeremy is asking about the website and phone number. We'll put that in the description of this video after it's over. Jeremy, just come back and check that out. Um, and then Lisa Holiday asked about what hatchery do you use? Yep, Keith Smith. Um, it's kind of like a private thing. Uh, we I think they're headquartered in Arkansas. I think. Exactly, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we actually were really lucky that they bring up to um, a bigger farm up in this direction. Mm -hmm. So we can get them right from like eight to 12 hours after they're hatched, mm -hmm. they're in our brooder. Oh, which wow. has been a game changer because we used to have to get them shipped through the mail. Yeah. And um, as a lot of you probably know, there's a lot of problems with delayed. So, I mean, there's been some times where we didn't get them for three or four days mm -hmm. after we uh, ordered like When you, you know, ordered them in the mail. So, yeah. yeah. So it's been really nice to... So right now, Keith Smith, though, hatchery? Yep. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So, guys, we're just walking over here to check out these two other schooners, and behind it, there are some beautiful cattle we're going to talk about as well, and about how Joe's been integrating that into his operation. Yeah. Um, okay, Jeremy King wants to know about this bright green hose. Okay, hose. That's a great question. Uh, we went through different kinds of hoses. This is Flexzilla. Let me show um, you up. We get it from, we have Menard. I don't know if you guys have Menards down by you. Mm -mm. Um, we get it from Menards, and then we go to a split. Um, somewhere, there's a split, and we just split it off to our, um, 
different coops. coops. Yeah. Gotcha. So you just have it on a splitter. So why why is the hose so important? Yeah. So we had a lot of hose kink. This stuff doesn't kink very easily, mm -hmm. and it's very pliable. Uh, we had some stiff, cheap hose, mm -hmm. and those would just break a lot. Uh, they would leak a lot. This and has been what we found to be the best alternative. To and it's visible. Does that help too? I think it does. Yeah, because we want to find it. I mean, every day we're moving it, so yep. you don't want it to get buried too deep. I think there is like it would be nice if it was white, because it would keep it a little cooler maybe. Um, but other than that, it's the best hose we've found. So um, you got a different structure here, right? Yeah, this is the first structure we used, um, and it works pretty good. It's, uh, this is Polytech. Um, Cobb Creek Farms is who we got it from. They sell them, uh, and it's 36 by 20. Okay. And it's a taller roof, which is kind of nice, depending mm -hmm. on where you're at. Um, we just decided to go with a little bit bigger structure, which are, those are 12 feet longer um, from Hengear. So. And then 36 by 20, you say you do about 400? Four to 500, Four to yeah. 500 it just depends on how long you're gonna raise them. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause it's, it's more about like pounds of live animal per square foot kind of a thing. So gotcha. if you're gonna raise them up to be really big chickens, then you're gonna wanna do less. Same with turkeys. So we're only bringing our turkeys to where they're gonna dress out at like 12 to 16 pounds. So they're about half, they're only going to end up being half the size of a lot of turkeys out there. So we don't need as much room for them. Gotcha. I saw a sign over here. I want to ask you about. Um... Oh, the electric. Yeah. Is this electric? It's not anymore. Okay. Um, we used to when we first started. We didn't have dogs or anything. Mm -hmm. We used to have an electric wire that came out about six right here, about six inches. Uh huh. And it was just it was on a solar charger. Yeah. And. Uh, it was just, if something tried to dig under, they'd hopefully get zapped. Gotcha. But we don't use that anymore. How, how did that work for you? It seemed to work good. We didn't have many problems. That's good. And we didn't even have a perimeter fence or anything. Oh, okay. Nice. So we, I, think it, I think it worked well. Do you ever have issues with like trying to clear it, having to clear it and like make sure nothing was grounding it or? Um, this we didn't because um, since we're moving it every day and it was relatively short grass, um, we didn't have any problems. This perimeter fence, the bottom wire does get some ground on it. So I don't think the, I don't think the bottom one's even on right now. That's, I don't think so. Gotcha. We'll poke our heads in here. Yeah, for sure. Hey guys, we'll get to you in just a minute. Don't go nowhere. Anywhere. That's right. <laughs> oh, I see. I'm nice. I'm going to ask you about that. These are some good looking birds. Yeah, they're they're going to the processor on Sunday. Awesome. So. Well I got here just in time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they're they're about as big as they're gonna get. Um, yeah. And how many do you have in here right now? I wanna say about four hundred maybe five hundred. Okay. I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. We have a sheet though, every so this is a flock, these two together are a flock, and we've got a sheet on what's where and sure. You know how many die we write down how many are you know die how many buckets of feed we give them if there's anything out of you know ordinary if it was a weird weather we write that down in notes mm -hmm. uh, i could even grab one of those later and kind of show you what we take notes yeah on. that might be good um we had a question from uh, kennedy reynolds actually about schooners um mm -hmm. how many different ones have you how many different ones have you tried and what's been your favorite uh we've tried two so far our favorite is um the hen gear the bigger ones mm -hmm. um but there's pros and cons to both of them. And is that other one over there? That's the, the uh, same as this. Uh, okay. Uh, hen gear. Okay. Which you can get on our website. Um, and uh, but maybe this is a good time to lead in. We are designing a coop that's actually going to be 30 feet wide by 60 feet long, but it won't move in this direction. It'll actually move sideways. Oh wow! So these will be right on the ground, and that will be the sled, and where there's wood over there that will be open and it'll be rubber, kind of like what's here. Okay. And then we'll have big garage doors on the ends. Mm -hmm. So it'll be really nice for loading and unloading. Oh yeah. And, and we'll have a passenger door also. And that's the coupe we're gonna try to do automatic feeders in. Okay, so you, you're gonna go from move, to moving them this way. Yep. At bigger doors, automatic. Why, so why, why, do you, why is moving them uh, horizontally maybe better? Um, so for a few reasons, one, we, well, especially in this field, it's very short. We don't have like 20 miles of field. So if we go 60 feet long, we'll be at the end of the field where we have to move it sideways anyways. Mm -hmm. So this will allow us to go the length of a field and not have to turn or anything. 
It makes sense. It'll be the whole length, you know, the whole time that we have the chickens. Right. And, uh, I mean, in reality, these chickens, they move way more than um, commercial birds, but it would be difficult for a chicken. I mean, we're going 48 feet, and by the time we're done at this age, they they don't want to move much more. So gotcha. if we tried to go any longer, that way they only have to move 30 feet gotcha. instead of the whole 60. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Yeah, I see. So when you're moving them in the day, uh, doesn't have to move the whole space. Yep. It just moves this space. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So we already do that. We do pull these sideways when we get down to the end of a field. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a foreign concept to us. We'll, we'll see if hopefully the coop's not too big for our tractor to pull. That's no. So um, pasture bird out in California, mm -hmm. they have a huge coop. They can raise like 6,000 in it and they, they, it's actually moved, it's automated, so it moves itself. Mm -hmm. But we're just scaling that system down. Oh, I see. And we'll still move it. We won't, they're all on solar panels and it moves itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll still pull it with a tractor, but that's Paul, who, that's kind of where we got the idea gotcha. um, from him. When do you think you might have that? Uh... It's being, it's being manufactured right now. Okay, cool. Uh, we should get the kit here uh, probably in the next three to four weeks, I'm hoping. Nice. All right, I'm going to jump in here. So maybe next time we come back to Joe's farm, we'll be able to see. For sure. That, that super yeah. cool thing. So I've been having a blast. we got a few more things to show you guys. Keep sticking around. Um, if you're just joining us, we're touring Joe's farm in Three Rivers, Michigan, checking out his pasture uh, raised livestock operation here. We've been talking a lot about poultry. If you got any more questions about poultry, feel free to get them in because pretty soon we're going to start talking about the cattle. Um, I'm Tyler Pearson. Welcome to Heifer USA. We're live here and we're so happy that you're with us. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. Like this video so that more people can see it as well. Um, all right, let's see what else we got for questions. Sounds good. Um, say hi to, oh wait, hey, we have a Dutch friend. Oh, there you go. Annika van Gindren. There you go. She's from the UK, but originally from the Netherlands. Nice. Mark Motorman asked, do you process your own birds? And you said you don't. Yeah, that's a good question. We don't, we bring ours to King & Sons Poultry Processing in Bradford, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, they've been great to work with. Uh, and we just don't have the infrastructure or capital to do our own. Gotcha. So that relationship though, having a good processor is so important. critical to this operation, yes. right? I would, if you're looking at starting poultry, I would work your way backwards. So I would get the relationship with the processor first, mm -hmm. and then feed, and then chick, and then everything should just line up from there. But those three, a feed, uh, a relationship with a feed mill, a chick uh, hatchery, and a, a processor are very important. Gotcha. Sorry guys, I know I'm moving the camera around, but I know the, the screen is flickering just a little bit, and I want to check my cables, make sure they're good to go. So, uh, but folks do their own processing on farm. Yeah. Um, especially at smaller scales, but some folks do it at larger scales as well. For sure. And actually, uh, if you guys are enjoying this live tour, uh, do subscribe to the channel because next month, uh, I think the August, I think it's gonna be August 17th or 21st. I think it's August 17th. We're gonna be doing another live tour in uh, just, just outside of Bonita Springs, Florida at Circle C Farms, and they have a completely vertical integrated operation, which means they do their own processing on the farm. Uh, so you'll be able to ask questions about yeah, awesome. on-farm processing if you wanna know. A um, Couple more questions about the coops here, and then we'll yep. go hang out with your cattle. Um, recoup. Bricole, probably pronounced that wrong, but he they asked um, how old are these chickens? These I th believe are seven or seven and a half weeks. Okay. Um, and that's about the time they go to processing. Yep, exactly. S anywhere between seven and eight and a half weeks we usually process. Cornish cross. Cornish cross. cross. Yep. Cobb 500. Cobb 500. Okay. Um, <laughs> Greg Robinson asked, are these chicken coops hailproof? We have had a little bit of hail. We don't get a lot of the crazy storms that some people do. We get some wind, which is why we're big proponents of keeping tree lines up too. A mm -hmm. lot of a lot of farmers around here take tree lines out, but it's a huge windbreak and it's right. great. So you can see all around here, guys. Yeah, it's got so like tree lines. most farms around here, see these trees right in between our two fields? They would just take all those trees out. Right, right. But we like them because it breaks the wind up a lot. Yeah. Um, but the dogs like them too. I saw they're yep. chill, chilling under the exactly. shade. Exactly. <laughs> 
But we have had some hail and we haven't had any problems. Although I do believe that having this on really Which, helps protect it. Yeah, because you got a nice thick layer enough to help cushion it. Yeah. And this is, yeah, I could see. It uh, could pop, it could poke through that. It could go through that. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that's a great that's question a great though, question, Greg. Yeah. Um, okay. So this design is the same one as over there. Same one as over there, but it's got chickens in it. Uh, this one, we actually have a tarp on. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually produces a, or gives them a hundred percent shade. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which is a little bit different. Yep. Uh, but it's still got the plastic underneath as well. Nice. Uh, so the plastic's kind of nice because early seat, like the first batch, we sometimes don't even have these shade cloths on because mm -hmm. uh, we want it to actually be a little warmer in there. And we don't have like these end panels off. Um, but then it's nice to be able to take it down and or have it up and take down it. corners and stuff like All that. All right, let's check out your cows. Yeah. So the cows are very, we're still very new to us. Uh -huh. uh, we got them last June. Um, these are Dexter cows, so they're a smaller chick or a smaller cow. Mm -hmm. um, we can go right in here if you want. Yep. yep. And we are moving them one to two times a day. Uh huh. Uh, as you can see, we had a, a tree fall on our fence right there a few days ago. So we still got to get that fixed, but uh, they've been a great addition. Are they fairly docile? Yeah. Yep. I mean, they won't really let us touch them much. There's, uh huh. One one cow will. Oh no! But they uh, they'll let us get close to them. No problem. And so why why have you introduced cattle to your operation? Uh, first of all, the first reason was the chickens grow a lot of good grass, and we wanted something to be able to come and eat a lot of it, mm -hmm. um, and turn it into something. So they worked out great for that. And then it's just the relationship between bird and you could say beast or <laughs> omnivore or whatever mm -hmm. is a great tool to build good soil. Gotcha, gotcha. So the impact that they have, the fertilizer yep. they're putting out on the ground. Exactly. Um, and the, ch the chickens and turkeys will come back afterwards and spread that all over the place, eat the larva in it, and it's, it's just a great awesome. combination. And so w what'd you start out with? What's What size? And uh, We started out with 14 of these Dexters. Mm -hmm. uh, we've since had two calves and I think we've processed six of the steers. Um, and they've been working great. I like it because I wasn't buying much. I don't. I was just eating a lot of chicken, and now I got steak to eat. So <laughs> I've enjoyed that. But um, no, it, we've really enjoyed them. They've been a great addition. And um, you got it. As, uh, folks probably can't see on camera, but he does. You have paddocks already set yep. up. We have tomorrow's paddock um, set up. They were moved in here this morning, um, and then we've got their minerals and their water that we move every day too. Gotcha, gotcha. So where were they yesterday? Uh, they were right in this corner back here. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then you're just using these these pigtail posts. Yep. And uh, poly wire. Poly wire. Yeah, that'll be hot. Yep. <laughs> that is electrified. Cool. Yeah. So then we just hook right on this reel, right onto the electric fence, and it uh, gives it a nice, good hot. And what do you so? Food you got in, in in good supply. Thanks, yep. chickens. That's right. Um, and Mother Earth. What are you doing for the rest of your infrastructure? Here? Yeah. So we've got a water that we have on a sled. Mm -hmm. uh, I like everything to be to be just pulled really easily. Mm -hmm. um, so they've just got this water all the time. It's hooked up to a hose, just like our chickens, and it just keeps itself filled up with this uh, float valve kind of thing. Float valve. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and then we've got it hooked to our mineral feeder. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of daisy chained along. So we only have to pull one thing, mm -hmm. which is really nice. And this is a buffet, uh, buffet style mineral feeder. So these are all different minerals that they can come and get what they need slash want. Um, and it's not just a mixture of everything because if they don't need zinc, they know if they need zinc. Right. So they'll come get zinc. Mm -hmm. But if it's a mixture, they just take zinc because that's what's in it. Gotcha. And Na is just sodium. You know better than I do. Probably, I sodium. <laughs> probably Looks yeah. Looks like they're going for it. Yeah. Nice. And then we, I don't know if you can smell it or not, we've mixed some garlic into it also, and that's supposed to help with fly Let's control. See. I can. I can smell it. That's amazing. Yeah. So they'll, the, the, it gets into their bloodstream and then they kind of sweat it out and the flies don't like the um, garlic, I guess. So it's, I think there's 18 compartments and all different minerals. All different. 
Yep. Yeah, so guys, actually, if you want to learn more about this, uh, it's called a Free Choice Mineral Feeder. That's right. We have a video on our channel you can check out. Uh, just hit that subscribe button and go check it out after this live stream. Uh, but you can see what it was like for us to use this versus what we were using before this. Uh, so we do kind of some before and after comparisons. Oh, that's, yeah, I want to watch that. That's yeah. interesting. So this is a great setup to show folks who want to get started, I think, yep. um, because you don't have to have water lines installed all no. over your property necessarily. Yeah. Um, you just need at least one decent source and a ton of garden hoses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've probably got, I don't know, probably 50 hoses that are all 50 feet long. Well, maybe more than that. I don't know. We've mm -hmm. got a ton of them. Um, and I think it's still better than, you know, you could come in and trench and put a bunch of infrastructure in, but until you know where you want to spick it, it's good to it's good to try it out and see like, okay, we know this would be a good spot to have a water line. Gotcha. But if you just go, if you just get, if you're just getting a property and you just put something in, you don't know if that's where you end up wanting it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it makes sense. So I mean, it's really impressive. I mean, and the guys, everything that we've shown you um, is really only about like what half of it. I mean, the rest of your birds. How yeah. many schooners do you have on the other parcel? We have ten total. Three of them are here, okay. so we've got. So we've got more seven more of these structures. Uh, are they all full or? They're all full right now. All full right now, yeah. full of birds. They're so all going to be emptied in the next week. Um, and then the, what's in the, there'll be a week of nothing in them. And then what's in the, uh, I guess it won't be a half a week with nothing in them. And then what's in the brooder will come out to pasture. Okay, nice. Um, so guys, if uh, you're still with us and hanging out and you've got any more questions, please just go ahead and get those in. I think we're going to start walking back to the farm here in just a minute. Yep, perfect. Um, show you guys the farm stand where Joe's got product for sale. Answer your questions along the way. Say hi to these beautiful Dexter cattle. Yeah. So why did you choose Dexter? Uh, we just kind of fell into it, actually. A friend of ours was getting, he was selling his whole herd. Mm -hmm. So we just bought them all from him. Yeah. I actually, one thing that really drew me to them is that's a full-grown cow right there. Mm. Oh, and they're it's like, small then, yeah. They're small, small frame. Yeah. And having never worked with big animals before, mm -hmm. I thought it was good to get used to, you know. We do have some Angus cattle at our other farm, and those are like... Twice the size of these, so I just—it was nice to work with a smaller animal. And uh, I've heard that do they finish well on grass? They finish really good. Yeah. That's what I've heard is that they're good for a grass-fed and finished yep. operation. They taste amazing. Um, this is our first year doing Angus, so we'll see how those fill out and if they if they taste as good. But we nice. we've enjoyed them. And then, really, it's pretty simple. We just set up a new paddock of uh, pigtails mm -hmm. and. When it's time to move them in the morning, we'll just, we'll take those two dead handles right there and just pull them back. And they are custom now. They're trained to just, they want to get that fresh salad bar. I, I think we, we've been testing out with quite a few different uh, fencing operations actually, yep. and working on making that into some videos. Um, you know, different automatic systems. Oh yeah. Um, one, it, I don't know what it's called, um, but it just looks like big flywheels, like spokes, right? Oh yeah, right? they spin. And they spin. Yeah. Yeah, and so we, we've we used those too. So uh, if anybody's curious about different fencing operations, subscribe to the channel, because we got some more videos coming out about that. Have you seen well. the video of a robot that moves it? No. I'll have to find <laughs> it. I saw it on LinkedIn. It's, a, it's a, like a solar powered robot that will move this. I think it just, it's two of them. And it moves it like a foot, maybe an hour or every half hour, it moves it over a foot. So it's just like as the day goes on, they're getting fresh pasture instead of all one big move. Okay. It's slowly moving yeah, the whole thing. That's pretty neat. Yeah. So yeah, so we were talking about paddocks earlier and you couldn't really see him over there, over there but you can see just how he's got his next day's paddock set up. And you'll, like you said, you'll move him into here and then you'll set up the next yep. paddock kind of at the same time. Yeah. This is kind of our trouble corner. You can see there's a lot of weeds back here. Mm -hmm. um, but the cows have been helping with that too. They'll just come in and we, that's what kind of giving them one small area kind of forces them to eat some things that they wouldn't necessarily want to eat. Mm -hmm. But then it gets it and it's, then it can kind of die off. Right. Yeah, so that makes that's, sense. A lot of people use goats for that same reason. Mm -hmm. Any goat farmers in the audience watching? Uh, we've had, we get a lot of questions about raising goats. Which way? Oh. Right here. Yeah, we get a lot of questions about raising goats. Um, I need to find a good goat farm. If you're a great goat farm and you want us to come do a live stream at your farm, let me know. Because we don't do any goat farming either, but it seems to be uh, pretty pretty popular. Yeah. Those, the two, they're more just pet goats up by our house, but mm -hmm. I want to take them and I'm really allergic to poison ivy. Mm -hmm. 
and they'll eat poison ivy and kill it. So I want to take them and move them to different areas that we have big patches of poison ivy and just let them oh, that, go to town. Oh, that's brilliant. I need to borrow a goat from somebody then. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, check in with the audience uh, on the way back. Let's make sure we show those dog shelters somebody was asking yep, about. for sure. Um, well, Kennedy asked, do you have any, or do you handle any calving yourself? But you probably haven't gotten to that point yet, have you? We actually, we didn't realize two of the cows we bought were pregnant. So we did have calves this uh, spring. Uh-huh. And that was a really uh, fun experience. We've never had calves on the farm before. Oh, wow. But, uh, so that we have, but it was kind of unintentional. <laughs> Everything go, go, go okay though? Yeah. Good. But uh. they're, I don't know, they're really good moms. They seem to have done a really good job. Um, Can't just sit right in front of me, sweetie, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll just plop himself down. So these are just, um, a lot of hog farmers use these, hog. Yeah, we've got some, we got them in lots of our videos, just pig huts, right? Yep. So they can just come under here and chill. Um, and then we just got a horse trough too for that automatically fills up mm -hmm. and we just bring them food out every day. And it doesn't look like you have to move these very often. They can, they can cover this whole area fairly well. Yeah, and this is, we kind of picked pick this spot strategically. It's right in between the two fields so they can see things. Mm -hmm. It's up high and it's in the shade trees. Yeah. So it stays a lot cooler and it's a nice breeze through here. Yeah, oh yeah, just speak of the devil, yeah. there it is. So it's, you do want to be, be strategic with where you put you know, dogs or chickens or whatever, think about how your land is best set up for it. You know, mm -hmm. it's not always necessarily the easiest spot, like right up front, but it's the best spot, so. Nice, okay, we got a couple more questions here. Um, see, and if you don't know the answer to this question, maybe someone in our chat does, that's about the cause of blindness in cattle. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Does anybody else in the chat know about what might cause blindness in cattle? I have um, heard pink eyes going around quite a bit this year. Yeah, we, that's fairly common. And, uh, I think we've dealt with that a few times. Um, Dennis Williams, Goat Farm and Creamery, Bees Knees Farm in King William, Virginia. Well, we might just be in Virginia next. Who knows? There you go. Um, so Muhammad Rizwan asked, and I'm not sure if this is for you or for me, but he asked, do you provide on-site training? Um, we don't personally, um, but I'm sure you guys have a yeah, lot to say so, about that. So that's what we do, Muhammad, um, at Heifer USA. We have a, a working ranch in Arkansas here in the United States, and we provide on-site training. We have a residential, uh, training opportunity there, a uh, formal apprenticeship program partnership with, uh, Center for Arkansas Food and Farms, and we have this, hopefully, good YouTube channel full of information for you to learn from as well. And hey, you don't have to leave the house to get training and you can yeah, just, right. why not? Um, so yeah, so check us out on the web uh, at heifer.org slash USA. And you can learn more about some of those opportunities. Okay guys, so if you're just tuning in or if you've been with us for a little while, um, we're nearing the end of the live stream. We're just gonna walk back over to the main campus here, check out um, Joe's farm stand, answer any more questions that you guys might have. Um, and just want to first just say, this has just been amazing, man. Yeah, thank you for coming. Absolutely. How about you guys in the chat? Have y'all enjoyed this? If you're quiet and haven't asked any questions, but you've been watching, <laughs> let us know how the live stream has been and where you're watching from now's your chance you don't don't gotta you're not going to be put on the spot just let us know how you've been enjoying the live stream maybe type a one in the chat if you're enjoying today's live stream there you go jeremy king asks do you do anything special to raise the dogs out here or is it just the perimeter fence so anything else for him um you, there is a little bit of training that goes into dogs. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like having them out here, these dogs much prefer to be outside than they do inside. Mm -hmm. So they're out here. They actually enjoy the winter more here. They don't. They did not like that. We actually did bring them inside into the air conditioning on those really hot days. Mm -hmm. um, but they just live out here 24/7. Um, they. This is their house. 
they're, they're not used to really anything else. Those are actually two of our puppies that we had on the farm. So they've been out here their whole life, um, besides when they were born for a few weeks inside. Uh, the training does kind of come into play um, as they get around the age they're at now. This is when it's like, they're starting to like, okay, what are we supposed to do with these chickens? Um, you really got to be on top of it if they are playing with them. Most of it's playful behavior. Right. But a 80 pound dog playing with a three pound chicken, it doesn't turn into playing for the chicken. So right. you really got to keep an eye on them and make sure you're disciplining them. <clears throat> we, to discipline ours, I kind of just push them down a little bit on the ground and I just growl in their face and show them the chicken and just like, this is not what you're supposed to do. Right. Um, dog speak for no, no. That's right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's about it. I mean, they eventually kind of just grow out of that anyways. Um, and their mom and dad, their dad's over at the other farm. Their mom's actually inside because she got a cut on her ear <clears throat> that we're treating. So, but they are, they're both really good guard dogs. Awesome. Thanks for the great questions, Jeremy. Throughout the broadcast, you've been a pleasure. Uh, we hope to see you back in the live chat for future broadcasts. Um, and wishing you the best of luck in your enterprise as you're getting started as well. Ryan Goodnews says, breed the Pyrenees with a Border Collie. They don't require as much training and do a great job. Oh, interesting. Never heard that before, but that. Um, Muriel Fournier saying hi again and uh, recommends the Heifer USA training program. Yeah, somebody asked earlier about on-site training. I told you about our residential program. Um, where you can do all the same agriculture and a little bit more. We also raise pastured pigs at Heifer Ranch. You ever think about doing pigs? We did. We used to do pigs. Mm -hmm. um, we don't anymore right now. We have thought about doing it. We work with a, a farm that raises pigs too, so we can sell their pork. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for watching. So D Real in Dallas, Texas. Um, Danielle Gibson tuning in from Washington. That's also my sister. <laughs> nice. She says they're, they're using this as a part of their summer homeschool study. That's you amazing. Go. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Rodney, thanks for the accolades. Watching in Minnesota. Appreciate you guys. So as promised, guys, um, we're going to show you the farm story. Here it is. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> the this church pews are for sale. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so th you said this is an old barn that is yeah. original to the property, right? Yep. Uh, looks like you've changed some of the paneling. We stuff, have. Yep, we redid this side and the front side. Gotcha. Um, that corner's original. What the is end this? Walls. What, what was this? Just old silo? Silo, grain yep. silo? Yep. So wow. they would probably put silage or grain or something in there. And then that's a corn crib where they'd put eared corn in there. Wow. You wouldn't believe how many people think that's a giant birdcage. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when I saw it, I was curious. Uh, yeah. Kind of so thinking. a lot of farms up here have those. Um, when they would harvest the corn, they'd throw the whole ear and corn everything cob everything in there mm -hmm. and then right in the middle there it would help dry it out and it would get turned to feed eventually very cool and then this uh, that's our area. winter uh, winter pasture okay so we call it like our sacrifice pasture so all winter long the cows we also have two horses uh -huh. there in here in the winter where uh -huh. we feed them hay okay yeah and why, why keep them off the, is there just because they're not going to be eating grass, so make it easier on yourself kind of thing? And or? mud. So mm -hmm. we're going to experiment this year. We had them in here all winter long. Take a look at it real quick. What we're going to do this year is we're actually going to, we're going to put them in here in like November mm -hmm. when it's still, when we still kind of get some freeze thaw, freeze thaw. And then end of December, January, February, we're pretty much frozen the whole time. We'll put them back out there. And then like snow frozen, like yeah, up to froze, your knees froze. probably, yeah. yeah. Because the problem is, is that if it gets thawed, if it gets, if we get like a warm day, they'll turn a grass, a grass field into a mud field very fast. Just their hooves messing it all up. Gotcha. So we didn't want to turn that all to mud. Um, so this is kind of just our, we just, yeah, call it our sacrifice pasture, but. Nice. Yeah, but it's quite different here in the winter time. Yeah. <laughs> it's cold and it's windy and it's. Hey, Jenkins Susan, thanks for subscribing. Appreciate you. If you guys are watching and haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button and hit the like button on this video so that more people can see it. And we can share, um, you know, Joe's Amazing Farm with more people all over the world. Rusty Montgomery watching in Alberta, Canada. Thanks for watching, Rusty. Um, one last question, then we'll head, in, head into here. Kennedy Reynolds asked, do you ever plant any cover crops? We have, that's a good question. We have not. Um, these are all perennials, so they come back every year. Uh, we 
we're considering ex experimenting with a cover crop in the sacrifice pasture actually we didn't end up doing this year but maybe next year where it'll it'll raise up a big portion of their you know a few weeks or a month of food and then they can just kind of eat on that we might have a customer come into the farm store but awesome. um yeah good timing so, then yeah <laughs> You want to step in here, or do you want to address your yeah, customer? Yeah, we'll, we'll just we'll step in here real fast. Okay. So if you need to greet them, go ahead. But this I, is our farm store. We have got a little video going of how we raise our animals. Oh, super cool. Um, and then we've got eggs, chicken, pork, beef. I'll show the folks this. So frozen chickens in here. Yep. They're nice. Does it slide open? Yeah, they slide right open. I'll show you guys. There you go. Joe's Farm, whole chicken. That's right. Right there. I like that logo, that's beautiful. Thank you. And uh, very nice. So if somebody goes online, they can buy something just like this? Yeah, we just started, so that's a bear with us if there's enough of you that want to buy chicken off our website. We just kind of get started on that. I'm not sure what we have on inventory, but if you're interested, we'll get it to you somehow. Gotcha. Um, and then we've got all different cuts and organs and feet and chicken stuff. livers chicken feet drums nice and your processor does all this for you yeah that's just so it's great. awesome yeah having a great processing partner guys very important critical we got eggs we got our beef and these are your beef that you raised yep. here yep very nice and then we sell jake's country meats pork also. Okay, and this is the farmer that you said that you're partnering with to sell pork? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Cool. Yeah, man, I, I'm personally very partial to pasture-raised pork. Yeah. I think it's my favorite protein right yeah. now. It's just, just it's so yeah. game-changing. Um, and who doesn't love... Who doesn't love bacon, yet alone yeah. uncured raspberry chipotle bacon? Yeah, I'm going to so have good. to pick up a pack of this before I leave. That's awesome. And then we've got syrup and honey also. And if you're thinking about opening up your own farm store, mm -hmm. I would highly suggest accepting Venmo. Okay, That's yeah. That's been a game changer for us. For a payment processor. Yeah, I would say three quarters of our income from the farm store comes on Venmo. Very cool. So very it really cool. excelled our sales a lot. So. See a little bit of history, history of Joe's farm here. Right. So cool. So if you're ever in the area, guys, Three Rivers, Michigan, come on down to Joe's yeah, farm. Yeah, for sure. Love to see it. And, um, Cool. Well, I don't think, I think we're good. Let's see, one question from Kobe Chase Farm yep, Company. Sure. How do you store your inventory? Uh, like chicken and stuff? Um, yeah. Probably. Mm -hmm. uh, we use just deep freezers right just now. What we just saw. Yeah, and then we've got another room with more deep freezers, but we're looking at getting a walk-in freezer. Very cool. Kind of at that point now, so. Let me spin this backpack off real quick and we're gonna sign off. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining us for this live stream tour of Joe's Farm in Three Rivers, Michigan. Yeah, uh, Joe, thank you so much thank for you. having Come us. In. This has been amazing. I've enjoyed it so much, learned a ton. I hope that you have too. Uh, our next live farm tour, August 17th, I'm pretty sure. Um, Bonita Springs, Florida. We're going to be touring a 100% vertically integrated um, farming operation where they're doing red meat and white meat processing on the farm that they're raising. Uh, Circle C Farms. So subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, sign up for our email list, and you'll make and you'll definitely know the next time that we go live. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Thank you yeah, so much, man. Thank you. Left-handed chick yeah. there, but awesome. Thank you, everybody. It's been All great. Right. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Awesome. How's it going, guys? Hey, how are you? Very good. Caught us right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we didn't want to. No, you're good. Can I do you? Good to see you. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs>